the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom, now and ever, and today, each all ages, amen. <coughs> today is the third Sunday of the blessed month of Hamshia. And as we were saying um, last time, uh, just to keep in your mind the structure of the first half of the Coptic calendar, um, we start with the months Tut, Beb, and Hatur, and then we continue with Kiat, Tuba, and Amshir. And the themes of Kiat, Tuba, and Amshir is the birth, the epiphany, and then the Eucharist. <clears throat> um, and, uh, of course, today, as we said before, the main book or, or, and the main chapter that the church focuses when we talk about the Holy Communion and when the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaks of him being the bread of life is from which chapter in the Bible? It's important for us to know this, especially in our conversations with those who doubt the importance of communion and the importance of the sacraments and the importance of taking the body and the blood of Christ. Um, so that's John chapter 6. <clears throat> um, and as we have been going through this chapter, or the first part of this chapter, in the last three weeks, <clears throat> um, as we discussed last time, uh, today we hear from the words of the Lord himself, describing him to be the bread that comes from heaven and that gives us the power also and the blessing to rise with him to heaven again. <clears throat> and this bread, as we know, is very important. And in this chapter, it's not just a monologue where Christ speaks about himself, but if we seek clearly, it's a dialogue where he responds to the concerns and the questions and the doubts of the people that are there because they come to him after he performs the miracle and they want more, <laughs> but they want more of the wrong thing, action. <clears throat> so uh, the gospel starts today, as we said, where we left off two weeks ago in verse 27. <clears throat> Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. And then the people say, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? We, we want to do what you just did. And he said, no, no, that's not the idea. The idea here is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. You need to believe in me. <clears throat> you don't need to perform miracles. Then they said, okay, we need a sign. A sign that we have to believe in you. Give us a sign just like God gave, the God the Father gave us the manna in the Old Testament. <clears throat> he said, okay, my Father will give you the true bread that comes from heaven which is himself. They said, okay, we want this bread always. They said, okay, <laughs> we'll give you the bread of always. I am the bread of life. Um, and then he starts speaking of this mystery and they couldn't take it. <clears throat> said, how, they claimed, complained about him because he said he was the bread that comes down from heaven. He said, don't, don't we know this man? He is the one, the son of, of Joseph, uh, whose father and mother we know. Uh, and they said, how, how can he say I have come down from heaven? Um, then the Lord says, do not murmur among yourselves that you're focusing on the wrong thing here. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we can't come to Christ unless God brings us to him. <clears throat> um, but he will get, and it, he, he mentions the important aspect of once we believe in him, once we follow him, once we partake of his body and blood in, in the bread and manifest in the bread and wine on the altar, he will raise us up on the last day. He keeps repeating this phrase, um, <clears throat> to I will raise him up at the last day. And instead of going into the depth of, of this part, actually, we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on the, the proxies or the, the acts of the apostles that we read today. And you remember, because it ties in, as we have said before, all the readings tie into the same theme, um, regardless of the day that it, it, it is. Um, so today we read from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Um, and the first part has to do with um, what St. Paul did uh, in his third visit to the, the city of Troas. And but we'll, we'll go into it verse by verse and uh, see how St. John Chrysostom speaks of <clears throat> the, the beautiful miracle that is done here. Um, so in the first two verses, it says, Now on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, so the tradition to come to church 
or to come together and to pray to perform the sacrament of the Eucharist um, was a was from the first century. Um, <clears throat> Saint Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So again, we see here what there is a sermon, and there is actually it extends <laughs> very long, not just a few minutes, but several hours. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> here we see that the main reason why they came was to break bread, was to partake of the body and blood of Christ. Um, but there was also a reading of scripture, but at the time they didn't have the New Testament written down. And there was a, a, a homily or a sermon given by the, the father, right, St. Paul. <clears throat> Um, and this tradition is very ancient, which is why the church keeps the same tradition. We can't have the liturgy of the faithful or the Eucharist without the liturgy of the word. We need the word of God um, first. And <clears throat> um, so here we see that scripture has no power without the sacrament, and the sacrament um, cannot be performed without scripture. Um, and these two things are important. Some churches only focus on scripture. Um, and we don't call them apostolic churches because that's not what the apostles did, right? We have to have the word of God, but that's not it. It leads us to a deeper mystery with Christ in the sacraments. Um, and we need the Holy Spirit to work in us and to help us to live the words that we read. And some people say, I just need to take communion. I don't need anything else before that. I say, no, that's not, that's not the tradition. You can't do that. We have to have the word of God. Uh, okay, I read it at home. That's not... The same. <laughs> there is a special blessing, a special power, and a, a special um, miracle that happens when we hear the word of God in the church. Um, of course, during these times, it's difficult for all of us to come. But nevertheless, the, the person who has the desire and has the, the, the intention to follow the church, even if they can't, the, the, the Lord blesses them nevertheless. Um, so uh, we need scripture to lead us and to direct us to receiving the sacraments in a worthy manner. Um, and, and this is what the Lord speaks about last night in the Vespers. He said he was rebuking them for saying, you're just focusing on scripture. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. But he didn't say that he is the word of life. He is the word of life, um, but the bread of life, right? Uh, <clears throat> And so he says, these are they which testify of me. The word is bringing you to the sacrament. Um, but you are not willing to come to, you're not doing, willing to do the last part that you may have life. Um, of course, not, not you, but this is what the Lord is saying to those who doubt the sacrament. Um, and uh, just some background of the city, uh, Troas, it was a Roman colony. Um, it was the third time St. Paul visited this this. Uh, group of people, and he helped establish the church, of course, um, and he is following up in their progress. So he stays about seven days, and then he leaves. Um, he, he, he celebrates the liturgy with them um, on Sunday, and then he plans to leave them. So that's why his sermon gets a little extended. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what does St. John Chrysostom write about this? He says, okay, imagine um, he says the, the place that this happened um, <clears throat> with its lights, with its crowd, with St. Paul in the midst, um, discoursing even with the windows occupied by many. What a thing it was to see, to hear that trumpet. He's talking about St. Paul. And behold the gracious countenance. <clears throat> um, see how everything, he said, see how everything was secondary to the sacrament and to the preaching. He says it was also, it says, the Lord's day. Not even during the night time while he was, was he silent? No, rather he discoursed because of stillness. Notice, notice how he both made a long discourse and beyond the time of supper itself. <clears throat> so he's very familiar. St. Paul is very familiar with this place. Um, and they were growing spiritually. And St. John Chrysostom is saying, look at these people, how they pri prioritized going to church and, and listening, even though St. <clears throat> Paul went longer than um, 
than they expected. <laughs> um, and again, this is how long did he go? He went until midnight. Um, so uh, they, they probably gathered to have the very early morning liturgy, like, like what was a custom back then in, in the sunrise, to, to, to finish liturgy around sunrise. <clears throat> um, and uh, their intentions were good. And sometimes we review Eutychus for falling asleep, but most likely his intentions were good, as St. John Chrysostom says. Um, and some people say, well, well that was St. Paul. <laughs> um, they, if, if it were St. Paul, I would be willing to stay up all night listening. It doesn't, I, mean, I understand I'm not a St. Paul. <laughs> um, but St. John Chrysostom says, you're not, you're foc- that's not who you should focus on. He says, such was their eagerness to hear him. Let, let us take shame to ourselves. Yes, but a Paul you say was discoursing then. Yes, and Paul discourses now, or rather not Paul, either then or now, but Christ. So when we hear the word of God, when we hear uh, homily, we should take it as if it is the word of Christ, regardless of the weakness of the speaker. Um, <clears throat> because if God wants to speak to you, he will speak to you. Um, but he, he wants to work with the one who is humble enough to come and to listen um, at home and in church. Um, and, and he says, uh, no window in the case now, no lack of hunger or sleep, and yet we do not care to hear, no crowding in the narrow space here, nor any other such comfort. <clears throat> so the question is the same as what St. John Chrysostom is saying. Do we care to hear? Um, and, and this is hard because sometimes we're bombarded with a lot of things to lend our ears to um, uh, in, in, in society at large. And there's many homilies out there, and there's many uh, things that we can read, um, but we have to take care as to where we, we uh, get our sources of teaching from. We don't not want to fall in danger of the wrong teacher, teaching because it can lead us astray. Um, <clears throat> and St. Peter talks about this very uh, clearly and very often in his second epistle, if, if, if you doubt this. But this is just one verse that he says. Um, he says, Untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. So it's not just enough that they, they're Christian and they write something good that's Christian. Even if they're just speaking about the Bible, we have to take care to make sure that we have the right teaching that we're listening to. He said, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. So we have to be careful and wise and discerning when we begin to lend our ear to preachers, especially from outside the Orthodox Church. Um, that doesn't mean everything out there is wrong. but And I'm not speaking saying this out of jealousy, but there's many people that are eloquent, but that doesn't mean they're following the tradition of the, the church. Um, and it's important to be aware, if we're, if we're deeply rooted in the tradition of the church, we can be able to discern what is correct teaching and what is not. And then I would say, okay, you can dabble a little bit. Um, so it's not how we say something, but what is being said and what um, the implications of it are and how deeply is it rooted in what the apostles were preaching um, from generation to generation until now. Okay. Um, so we come to Eutychus, right? Um, he was young, most likely. He was between the ages of 8 and 14. Um, and because it was crowded, he was sitting in a window, and maybe it was also very hot because they had a lot of lamps in, in the room. <clears throat> um, and it says he was sinking into a deep sleep uh, because he was overcome, uh, as we'll see. He was still zealous, as St. John Chrysostom says. Um, but as he, he continued, St. Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Some people say he was not really dead, but St. Luke writes he was taken up dead, not taken up as dead. And this is important um, because if you doubt this death, then you would doubt the miracle that happened after. Um, and keep in mind, St. Luke himself, what was his occupation before being an apostle? He was a doctor, right? So, of course, he could be able to tell if someone is really dead or not. I'm sure he witnessed 
many sick people and many people who died. Okay, so this is important for us because again, there's non-orthodox teaching that said no, he he just fainted. Um, but scripture says he was taken up dead, and the apostle said that he was taken up dead. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> even some people doubt that Christ died on the cross because if they could if they could bring doubt to his death on the cross, then the resurrection has no power, has no meaning. So that's why they attack this. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, St. John Chrysostom writes, the wonderful circumstance is that though he was a youth, he was not indifferent. He wasn't, he, he, he cared. And though he was weighed down by sleep, he did not leave. So if he was too tired to say, forget this, I'm just going to go home and sleep. <laughs> he didn't do that, right? Nor was he afraid of the danger of falling. <laughs> It was not from uh, listlessness that he slumbered, but from necessity of nature. But observe, I beseech you, so fervent was their zeal that they even assembled in the third story, for they did not have a church yet. <clears throat> so th this shows that even though sometimes we're weak and we fall asleep in, in applying the word of God, um, God sees our desire and our intention, and he will raise us up. He will give us the power. We just have to keep trying. Um, even if we fall left and right, it's okay. Um, but the question is, where are you? Are you in the church? Or are you saying, I'm tired, I'm going to go home? Um, and again, I'm not saying this just physically, but where is your mind? Where is your heart throughout the rest of the week? Is it with God? Or is it with just the things in the world? Um, <clears throat> so the unique thing about this story is that when does it say that the boy is completely healed. It doesn't say right after St. Paul comes down. It says, but Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him and said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. So St. Paul just says the word, don't worry, he is okay. Right? <clears throat> and then they came up back to the, to the place that they were praying in. They broke bread, they took communion and they ate. This is the Agabi meal after. And they spoke a long while, another sermon or another meeting until daybreak, and then he left. And then it says, they brought the young man in alive. And they were not a little comforted. They were very happy. <clears throat> so the question is, why does St. Luke mention that about this boy after everything happened? I think it's because the point that we need the whole Sunday meal to get our resurrection. Um, <clears throat> we, we need the scripture we need communion. We need the, the community. We need the, the message, right? And that, will, that as a whole, what the church offers to us, gives us the resurrection. Um, and the, the, so he was, St. Paul initiated the miracle um, by whatever he did, most likely praying on him, and, and his life was resuscitated immediately. But the growth and the strength and the revival happened as a process. Sometimes the miracle hap miracles in the scripture happen immediately, and sometimes it happens as a process. Same thing with us. Most of the time now it's a process and, and not as immediate. Um, but nevertheless, there still is a power in it. Um, <clears throat> and so there's no other act, event, or sacrament that has as much power as blessing as, as this bread of life. Um, and our, like I said, our miraculous healing and power and transformation can be overnight and immediately, but most of all, it's, most often, it's a process that takes time. Um, and that's probably why St. Saint, Saint Luke mentions this at the end of the story and not at the beginning. <clears throat> so uh, just to conclude, we say every one of us is this young lad Eutychus. Actually, Eutychus means lucky one or fortunate person. Some people say, no, he wasn't fortunate, he died. But of course, if you look at the end of the story, he was very lucky to be in the midst of, of the church and to receive the power of the resurrection through the sacraments <clears throat> and through the, the apostle. Um, so we might be dead from the outside or our outer life might not be completely reflective of our inner beliefs and our inner faith. The same thing as Eutychus went after he fell. He had the desire, but he fell and he died. Um, but 
he was in the middle of the church when this happened. And the church said, no, no, we will pick him up. Uh, God will restore him. And because there is still life in him. Um, so we have to remember that we are the lucky ones. <laughs> we have, the, the, if we heed, take heed to the scripture and the sacraments, and, and we do our part, then the Lord and his apostle will come to you, revive you. Um, you will rise with him. You will break bread with him. You will abide in him. You will converse in him with him until daybreak, until your life in this world ends and the new life uh, begins. Uh, and you will rejoice with the resurrection that happened within you. Um, so let God revive you. He's watching you. He's witnessing your struggle. He's ready to act when you submit yourself to him. Many times we do suffer and we sleep, but he rewards the one uh, who trusts in him and raises him up and gives him power, just like Jonah, uh, as we celebrated this week. He disobeyed, just like often we disobey, um, and we sometimes do the complete opposite of what he asks us to do. But God still is there to rearrange the, sacram the, the circumstances in our life so we finally get the point and we return to him. Um, we just need to listen, to realize, to submit, to think, and to follow his lead. Um, so we need to prioritize the, this aspect in our life so that he can work more. Um, we start by making a plan for scripture uh, to be daily, especially now that since the Lent is coming up. Um, we start small, but consistency is important. Uh, take the, find the time to read and to listen Right to, to read scripture, but also to listen uh, to what the sermon that comes after, whether it is in the church or uh, a book, which sometimes is, is better because it goes much more in deep than, than 20 minutes. Right? 20 pages is a lot more than tw 20 minutes. Right? Like, for example, if you look at the news and you watch 20 minutes of news, it's nothing compared to 20 pages of the newspaper. Right? You get much more. Um, so the idea here is to read and to listen, right? Or, or to fill with the commentary that comes after reading scripture. And then we partake of the sacraments. May the Lord give us the resurrection in our life always so that we can be the fortunate ones and realize that we are the fortunate ones. And glory be to him now from the age of the so. Then she see a more